Hello everyone, this is Rob, and still on lockdown, but seems to be getting better, and I decided to do this video a little different today, is because over the weekend there was a question of someone making a summer spread and as many people said, a summer quilt, which was without batting. And I said that a quilt was a minimum of three layers stitched together. That's the definition. Everything else is a blanket, a cover, all the different words. And the argument ensued that... I was being an unknowing, arrogant American not knowing, and my answer was, I live in the Netherlands. And it's really interesting, all the places that I have traveled, uh, a quilt is a quilt. You go to Japan, even in Japanese, they talk about quilting and quilts they have a quilt show they have a quilt festival the tokyo quilt festival is a dream of mine so and my response was as being an older quilter because i've been quilting since i was a teenager with my grandmother that i tried to say explain the terminology for everyone so our beginners can know what people are talking about because this terminology is used in the video. So what I thought I would do is today do a video of my sewing room. It is a disaster I, because I couldn't figure out what to make a video. I'm still making lace. And I'm going to be making lace for a long time. And I can't keep making videos of making lace. So I thought I would sit down and go through some of the terminology. And, uh, and by living in the Netherlands, I'm going to say the Dutch version and a little bit of the German as well so that you can see the difference but it's interesting quilting it's you go to the quilt shop well we say quilt winkle uh but uh but it's interesting but in australia it's quilting in britain it's quilting in america it's quilting in canada it's quilting and if there are others that have a different name, I would love to learn them. I've traveled to Japan. It's quilting. I've been to India. It's quilting. <laughs> and, but they have different names for everything else. So that's what I thought I would go through and discuss is the terminology that you see in your videos. So first I'm going to show you, this is my Bernina and it is in a cabinet and it is set flat with the tray. This is called recessed in the cabinet and uh, it gives you a flat surface. This cabinet comes from Germany but it has leaves in the back so I can roll it out and it basically doubles the depth for quilting. That is the primary design. Uh, this is my faff. And this is, I use it mostly for embroidery and sewing. It is on a Martelli tip, tilt table. And let me tell you, this tilt table is magnificent because it gives you an angle that allows you to see more clearly what your machine is doing. In Dutch, this is called a bordure machina. In Dutch, this is a nye machina. 
and in German it's a nai machine. Mas, I can't do the German accent. But that's why I wanted to go over it. And I have some other stuff and I'm going to show you my favorites and why I use them and why I prefer them. But to give you the, we'll turn it around, I'm going to put you in the tripod so I can use both hands, there we go, we can tilt it up a little bit, uh, you can see my collection of stuffed animals on the top of the closet. The first thing I'm going to talk about is cutting mats. And I have an Ulfa one here. As many of you know, I also have Martelli ones as well. I love my Martellis because I not I do think they're better quality, but they're way, way more expensive. But for me, the yellow and the blue lines on the Martelli mat because of my vision issues just are so visual and to the point and it is the best mat for me but this is I have several Ofa ones I even have bigger ones as well uh, this one is definitely a European it's centimeters one side and inches the other but these are great mats too there are many great mats Fiskars whatever it doesn't matter what you use but I use the Martelli mats mostly because of the blue and the yellow. Because to me, it pops and it's very easy for me to line my rulers up to cut on the lines of the Martelli with the yellow. I have a hard time seeing the purple and yellow side as I have a hard time seeing this green and yellow. Uh... But that's a little bit, but whatever mat, but I like having a mat that is at least 24 inches wide and 36 inches long. That gives you the ability to cut a bolt of fabric folded in half, which is how it's folded on a boat, bolt, laying flat. Simple as that, so you can cut it. My next is rotary cutters. And boy, I have a collection of them just like Matt's. Because I had a stroke many years ago, and as I, the years go by, it gets harder and harder for me to work. Easy as that. I get cramps in my hand. I can't hold them. I can't see them the writing on the cutting mats or the rulers and I do many things differently because of that and because I love quilting it keeps my mind active so we have cutting rotary cutters this is the Martelli Ergo which you hold like this which is great I use this all the time when I'm cutting lots and lots of pieces because it just makes it so simple. Many of you have the standard pizza cutter. This again is an Ulfa uh, with guard. Great rotary cutter, nothing wrong, but it gives me cramps on my hands so I have a hard time. But my most used rotary cutter is which is strange, because it is also a pizza cutter, is a Kai. And I got this, and it has the setting that you can set it to do soft or hard. And what it does is it adjusts, because how this one works is the cover is automatic, and when you apply pressure, it moves down and exposes the blade for you and it cuts 
and I like it. I use this when I'm working by my machine with my Martelli roundabout. And you, again, you don't have to have Martelli, but I find I can see the markings more clearly on the Martellis. That's why I have them. And I use this with my rulers. I am a template person. I am not a ruler person. I tried with cutting strips. I invested in. I made and I bought a Creative Grid Stripology ruler. And a lot of people swear by these. There's June Taylor versions. Everybody now has a version. But this is the Creative Grid Stripology. And I have a hard time using it. It slips and slides. So I have really a lot of difficulty using it. And so what I went to for cutting strips for me is my Martelli. They call them skinny rulers. And I have a whole set of them. And they're a set of rulers. And they're one and a half by 24, two inch, two and a half, three, three and a half inch wide for me to cut strips. Everything else I cut with a standard ruler. I also use these with my walking foot to do straight line quilting between the blocks so I can keep my line, my first line straight and then I can use the edge of the walking foot or a quilt guide. But this really helps because it has the anti-slip on the back and you can run it up along the edge of your walking foot. Really nice, interesting set. I use these a lot. Uh, but I'm a template person. I have templates. This is the Martelli I've been cutting six and a half inch squares for a project that's coming in the future. And this is a six and a half and I like templates. Growing up, I used templates. And the reason I use, and I cut them out of cornflake boxes. And it was weird. Cornflakes made the best templates. They had not too thick, not too thin cardboard in their boxes. And they were the preferred template cutter. But these are actual size. I have a huge slew of these in all different sizes. I even have them up to, six, I think, 16 inches. Uh, but they're great because what you do is you just slap it down and cut around the edge. You don't have to measure. You don't have to think. You, don't, you just cut. You fold your fabric and cut. I have a whole slew of square-up rulers as people call them in all different sizes and I mean I have a lot of these and the reason is I have a hard time seeing the markings in these and so I have one pretty much for every size so like this is a five this is, a, I think this is a six inch square. So if I'm squaring up my project, I make sure the center is lined up and it's right on the block. And then I just cut around the edge. Uh, this is a four and a half. Uh, these are just a few I pulled out. This one's eight and a half. This one's ten and a half to square up. But I have the different sizes because I don't want to think. You can like use the corners and turn them and do all that, but you have to think. And my brain does not work that fast. So I have a slew of these. And my most used ruler is this. And I got it free for being a member of the quilt show. And it is a 3 by 12 ruler from Quilter Select. 
but it's not that it's from Quilter Select, it's just, it's 3 by 12 I use this by my machine for trimming up pieces. I use it for trimming and doing all kinds of little things. I really like the size. It's easy to handle. And for standard cutting, I have a 6x24 Martelli. I have the old one. They're black. I think they're black now. Uh, but I have an old white one. Great ruler because of the non-slip and works great with their cutting mat. But I also have, because I live in Europe, I have an Omnigrid in centimeters. And uh, I use this one quite a bit just because it's in centimeters when I need to deal with centimeters. Because when you're dealing with the embroidery, you talk inches, but actually everything is done in centimeters and millimeters. An embroidery hoop is not nine, not eight by 14 or whatever they say. It's actually like the maximum hoop for this faff width is 200 by 360 millimeters. There is a special 350 by 360 hoop, but you have to turn it. And my most used hoop is a 200 by 260, which is just shy of 8 inches. It's like 7.954 inches by 260 is like 10 and a half inches, somewhere around there. But see, it's not measured in inches. It's measured in centimeters and millimeters. So you sometimes need that. So now we go back to the quilt. We talk about our quilt sandwiches. And I have the projects that I've been quilting here. This is free motioned using the BSR. I cannot free motion without assistance. Uh, it's a mess. And, uh, but this is done with the BSR and uh, a stencil. Uh, but you notice it's three layers. You have your top, your batting, and your backing. And this is called stencil quilting. It can be many, many patterns. You can even get meandering stencils. Okay, for free motion quilting. But I use the BSR, and the BSR is the Bernina Stitch Regulator for those newbies. And it has a mo it has mode two, and it stops. So when I'm moving around and I have to stop and think, the needle stops in the down position. And I can reposition my hand. I can think about where I'm going how I'm going to do it without the machine keeps sewing. And it allows me to do a little bit of free motion quilting. Uh, without it, I couldn't do it. I'd have to do everything with a walking foot or straight line. Uh, and speaking of walking foot, this is walking foot quilting. And I used a zigzag. We'll turn it to the back. I've showed pictures of this before. But it's walking foot or straight line. And you'll hear people talking about that. Walking foot, straight line quilting. Free motion quilting means that you move the fabric freely to create your design. Walking foot means you use your walking foot. Straight line means it's in straight lines. But it didn't have to be straight line. I could have done the curves in the other one with my walking foot as well. Those curves are big enough. Quilting is generally one round. Uh, you hear people talking about that. Quilting is one round of stitching, but occasionally you will go back on yourself. This is edge-to-edge -edge quilting. And this pattern goes the length of this quilt. And it's in sections based on the width. 
of the long arm. Uh, this was done by my, a local quilter from that has a handy quilter. And uh, but if you really look at it, see you see there's only one row of stitching. Uh, red work, on the other hand, you hear people talking about red work, is exactly two rounds of stitching. So every line has two rounds of stitching. And you can do this with quilting. And this one is that way. Uh, this one is quilted in the embroidery arm. Each block was quilted inside the embroidery arm and it was done with two rounds so that would technically be red work but you can barely see because I matched uh, I can't show you the back because it wasn't quilted on the back because it was quilted in the hoop and this is applique uh, and we have pieced work which is piecing which is this which sews different pieces of fabric into one layer, into a pattern. This is very simple piecing. It's called a rail fence. And there was another argument that this pattern looked like swastikas. A lady had used black in the center of this exact same pattern, and they said it looked like swastikas and mine are white. And I'm going to tell you they are not swastikas. And uh, this is applique, where a piece of fabric is stitched on top of the other piece of fabric. Uh, this is a blanket stitch. A blanket stitch is actual very straight lines. Uh, you can use zigzag, blind hem. Uh, there's so many stitches. You can actually use decorative stitches. And then there can be satin stitches on the edge here to cover this edge. This is called raw edge, meaning that there is no, the fabric is not turned over, so it's the raw, ed, the raw cut edge is showing underneath this fabric. You have needle turned, or faux needle turned, let's see if I can. Here it is. Faux needle turn. And what you do is, there are several ways. You can literally needle turn it as you go, and you basically turn your fabric an eighth or a quarter of an inch in to give it a nice edge. Or what you can do is take a square piece of fabric stitch some water soluble stabilizer or fusible stabilizer soft thin fuse or something uh, I always use water soluble and you put the stabilizer on top you stitch your shape out then you cut out with a quarter of an eighth inch round and then you snip your stabilizer and you turn it right side out and it gives you a perfectly turned edge uh, you can do reverse applique, which means that you cut the shape out of the top piece of fabric, and then you put this in the back and stitch it down, and it's reversed. And again, you have raw edge and needle turn. Uh, you have, uh, this is Japanese cotton. It is a different weave. And you'll hear people talk about Japanese, but if you look, you can see it has a different pattern, but the fabric has a more woven texture. Uh, you have batiks. This is a batik that I have in Charm Pack, and basically the back and front are exactly the same. You have yarn dyed, or a lot of them called shock cottons. 
shock cotton is where uh, you have two yarn dyed colors like you'll have a dark red and a right light red and the weave up and down will be dark and the weave this way and it gives your fabric uh, depending on how you look at it it has different colors it if has movement in it uh, you have yarn dyed fabric which means the fabric isn't dyed it's the yarn is dyed and then it's woven you have uh, uh, You have stamped fabric, which means that the color, the printing is stamped on it at one time. Uh, you have normal dyed fabric where it's printed, and I think there's only like 16 or 18 colors that can be applied. But then you have printed fabric, which they print using almost exactly like an inkjet printer, and they print your design and spray the ink on it, and it's just printed on the top. Uh, I wonder, yeah, this fossil, I think I have some fossils burning here, which is, you will notice it. Yes, here we go. See, we have the fossil fern, which is a normal printed cotton. See how detailed it is? But then when you turn it over, it's almost like the back is not really printed. It's just a bleed through of the front. And so that's how you can tell because like the batiks are the same back and front, whatever the design is. Uh, and here's a big, you can tell how the fabrics are printed, how they're dyed. See how colorful they are on the front? These were leftover embroidery designs from another project. But look at the back. How, how faded. And this is just a standard dyed fabric. It's called Shadow Blush from uh, Benertex. And there's a hundred different colors in this line. And this fossil fern, also from Benertex. I really like this fabric, but it has also a different, a hundred different colors as well. Uh, so that's a little bit of the terminology. You have cotton thread. These are all made with cotton. This is called freestanding lace. This one's defective. If you see right here, it didn't catch. Right here on this edge so I had to throw these away but these are freestanding there's no fabric whatsoever they hold themselves together that is actually two strands of thread stitched together to create that bobbin thread and top thread this is done in cotton but you can also have polyester the reason you would use polyester today you can have what they call Horse spun polyester. And do not confuse coarse spun polyester with tri glow polyester. Coarse spun is they take the polyester fibers and they spin them and this looks exactly and feels exactly like dealing with cotton however it's massively thinner than cotton uh, and I'll do another video on weight but then you have the tri glow polyester this is an embroidery thread but it's shiny and this is flat like cotton it's not shiny and but I mean 
it doesn't matter what you use. There's nothing wrong with using any of it. Uh, you have binding. I use uh, a binding attachment that applies the binding back and front perfectly even and folds the one and a half strips perfectly for me. I have wool pressing mats. But the terminology we get, and it's nothing wrong with saying you have a summer quilt, which is just a top and a back. But that's incorrect, because a quilt technically has three layers stitched together, or more, because you can have multiple layers. One of the warmest quilts I ever used in my life was from my grandparents, and it had newspaper in it. Man, that quilt was weird to sleep under, but man, was it warm, because the upstairs of their house had no heat. Uh, but it's not that you're saying it incorrectly, or if I tried to correct you, it's not that I want to correct you. It's that I want you to under the beginners to understand the terminology, so when they see a video, they understand what's being spoken. Uh, why are edges pinked? This is a good one. Why is an edge pinked? Keeps it from raveling, unraveling. So most of your pre-cuts have pinked edges. Should you pink all your edges? Nah. And But you also get into the problems of, like pre-cuts. The five inch, this is a five inch charm square. But the five inch is measured from the top point of the pink to the top point of the pink on the other side. But, what's really weird is some of these are not 5 inches. They're like 4.9 inches. They're not accurate. So, if you're trying to do something 5 inches, your measurements are off. You should know these things. And it's not that it's bad fabric. You know, I get it, I measure it, and I go, oh, this is like 4.9 and a half inches. So I need to make, use a scant quarter inch instead of a quarter inch seam to make up for that little bit of difference. Uh, terminology is a big thing, and especially on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook where people give you the information like this. And one thing, pretty much nothing is new. So don't think that you go back to, because one of my favorite quilters is um, uh, Adetta Sitar from Laundry Basket Quilts. She has a lot of in, ingenious designs like dancing umbrellas and her butterflies and things like that. But a lot of her pieced quilts are really old designs that she's renamed. And we talk about budget. If you're diligent, you can go back and find the original patterns, which is free. Like the Tree of Life. She has one. Uh, she charges like $15 for the pattern. Beautiful pattern. Great for the measurements if you want to do it. Nothing wrong. It's great. But if you're on a budget, it's a Tree of Life or a Pine Tree. Uh, there's so many of the blocks that have been renamed and people are charging huge amounts of money for patterns that have been around for 200 years. And it's difficult. And I'm fortunate. I was taught to quilt many, many years ago, and I know a lot of the old patterns. I don't know them all, 
because there's thousands of them. But uh, companies like, look on the internet under Kansas City Star. They used to do a quilt block once a week in their newspaper. Uh, Mountain Mist always had the most wonderful quilt designs on the back of their batting wrappers. Uh, you have all these different sources that are old. Uh, look at the Dear Jane quilt from Jane Stickle, Vermont, 1700s. Pretty much every block design known to man is in that quilt and miniaturized. Uh, it's beautiful. And every place has their types of quilting, like Japanese quilts are like technical, magnificent pieces of art. They are perfection. Uh, India, the Raj quilts, they're so colorful and vibrant and magnificent. German quilts are wool and heavy and just luxurious. Uh, Australian quilts, the older ones, usually have to deal with Aboriginal and tribal and different patterns, and they're quite unique. Uh, I follow a quilt shop in Canada called Dragonheart Quilt Shop. She does a video twice a week, and one of the videos is she shows the new fabric. Canadians choose different fabrics than we have. And you're like, wow, I would have never thought of that. I actually bought some fabric from her because I fell in love with it. It's called Birdly Beavers. I rolled off my ca off, off the sofa laughing when she showed it. And it's this panel fabric with beavers dressed up in different like lumberjacks and oil workers and hunters and all this, and I thought it was magnificent, and I had to have them. And, but you would never find it. Uh, RJR has a line of fabric called Maple Fabric, which is only available in Canada. Beautiful colors. Uh, it's interesting to see the difference, because you learn you see different uses of color. And they're all magnificent in some way. Uh, they're all special because they're all unique. And that's what makes them special. They're unique. I can make a quilt using 5-inch charm squares and mine will be totally different than if somebody else makes it and it would be different than if somebody, if we used the same charm pads, because we would put the colors in different orders. I live in the Netherlands. We do a lot of things in blue. It's called Delft Blue. Uh, different patterns. We love our tulips and we love our windmills. Uh, there's a lady in Spain. I forget her first name, but it's Rojas. Uh, and she does some amazing quilting work. Germany, Claudia File. And Claudia is only like an hour from me. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to see her stuff in life. Uh, Australia, Pam Holland. America uh, is Jenny Byer, uh, Susan Stewart, uh, Sue Garman. These people make quilts that just make you go, <gasps> Canada, uh, God, what is her name? Um, I just knew, I just knew. Ryan McKenna, I think. Oh, I just love her. And then there's a lady, I actually bought her pattern for a Canadian quilt because I just love the pattern uh, and I can't
can't remember her name, but she's from Fireside Quilts or something. But you, you look at these people and you're like, will I ever make their quilts? God, no. But the inspiration. Susan Stewart does the most magnificent embroidery quilts using embroidery. Would I ever make one like she does? No. But it's an inspiration because I have a passion for lace. Again, Cindy Needleham, Needleham, with her lace. I mean, we we follow these people and we look at their quilt. Marilyn Badger, not my style of quilting, but oh my, uh, it's amazing. My go-to is Jenny Byers, Susan Stewart, Sue Garman, Pam Holland, and Claudia File. Those are my go-tos that I follow regularly for inspiration. Find yours. I hope everyone has a great day. This has been a long, boring conversation, but it's terminology. Boring, but we all need it. Talk to you later. Bye. Oh, forgot. Please subscribe. Talk to you later. This is Rob. Bye. <laughs>